Hi class, this is going to be uh, part one of two on the lecture that covers chapter two in your textbook. We're going to talk about the research process. Um, what I like about uh, this book and the reason, one of the reasons I chose it is because they tend to try and focus on a specific study or a group of studies by researchers that you know are emblematic of things that we're looking at in that chapter. So in this chapter in which we're going to really look at all the various um, types and approaches of, of research you might be conducting in the behavioral sciences, they pick a group of studies that nicely touches on all the different types. So a lot of times in the psychology research field, what happens is somebody decides that they have an area of study that they're interested in. So uh, for example, um, some of the research that I did when I was a graduate student was aimed at uh, looking at people who've been through 28 day rehab programs for substance abuse and trying to increase their attendance of aftercare. So finding various behavioral and you know um, psychological approaches for trying to increase that person's aftercare attendance because we know that leads to better outcomes. Um, as a result, there's lots of different studies that were conducted in that area. So any researcher who finds their area of study that they're interested in is going to conduct multiple studies. They're going to refine and come at the concepts from various different angles. There's oftentimes there's sort of a process of, um, you know, for example, in treatment research, you will have your initial study. You'll um, say, okay, this was effective versus the normal treatment. And now we're going to do a study where we break about, break apart all of the aspects of the treatment and figure out what the active, you know, ingredient is. Um, so there's all these ways in which we don't just do one study, obviously, on a topic. We tend to have a whole group of studies and sometimes entire careers, you know, focused on a singular area of research. And the book really focuses on this group of studies conducted by Dunn, uh, Acton, and Norton. Um, 2008 is one of the studies they focus on. But there's a whole group of research that these researchers did on one particular area. And it's going to allow us to look at the different types of uh, research approaches within the field. So the essential question of the research by Dunn and, and colleagues is, can money buy you happiness? Um, they were really trying to figure out if, uh, you know, personal wealth or personal financial security was associated with happiness. And what they found kind of counterintuitively was that income or amount of money had little influence on happiness factors. And then they went on to do additional studies to try and figure out what were the factors as they relate to money. And what they found that sp is that spending money on other people has a more positive impact on, ha on happiness than spending money on yourself. And they did a lot of follow-up research that utilized diverse methods and techniques, and they designed investigations to test this, what they call pro-social spending hypothesis of happiness. Um, so after the initial study, they, they decided to go and look and, you know, figure out what the moving parts were. And they did some research that was published in the journal Science in 2008. And um, they investigated how people's spending choices influence their happiness. And they found that income ha did have a small effect on happiness, but that it seemed to have little effect in countries where your essential needs were met, which is an interesting concept, right? That perhaps money in some uh, countries or cultures, money provides a certain degree of happiness because it provides basic security, but that if those essential needs are already met, then no additional income really seems to increase your happiness. It's a really, that's an interesting point to consider when we talk about, you know, a lot of different social safety net programs. Um, there's also this idea that th they found in, in related research that the relative income to others had a greater effect on your happiness than your absolute income. So within your social circles, being wealthier than those around you seems to have some impact on your happiness. Um, but not absolutely. It was all relative. So there's, there's a comparison process involved in that somewhere. So let's move on and talk about different types of approaches to research, different processes that we can employ. So we might say um, essentially that there are two broad approaches to research in, in the behavioral sciences. And when I say the behavioral sciences, that's just synonymous with, you know, in this case, psychology and some related fields. But um, it depends really greatly on the questions that you're asking and what types of answers you hope to discover. That's that, that's going to guide which of these two basic approaches you tend to utilize. Uh, we're going to break them down as experimental and non-experimental. So when we use the term non-experimental research, what do we mean? Um, non-experimental research is quite common in psychology and a lot of the other quote-unquote soft sciences or social sciences. Um, 
it focuses on specific conceptual variables like we talked about before it's descriptive in nature so it's trying to describe a phenomenon rather than really getting into the explain and prediction and control purposes of science or goals of science we discussed previously uh, it's much more on the descriptive level so it's kind of starting the process of defining and, and differentiating variables in a lot of ways um, it tends to use correlational statistics and we'll talk about that in the future very soon uh, to quantify these relationships between variables remember that correlation is simply saying that two things vary in a systematic way you know um, I always come back to this example because it's very concrete but if you look at human beings height and weight are highly correlated right they're not a perfect correlation um, but the taller you are the more you tend to weigh the shorter you are the less you tend to weigh and, and, and inversely you can say the same thing um, but it doesn't establish cause and effect it simply says that these two things co-vary and the statistics that we get out of non-experimental research will often indicate indicate how closely two things are related but it doesn't exactly explain any causal relationship for us experimental research however on the other hand is really uh, the one that we use when we're trying to um, predict the effect of a causal agent and it's uh, designed around this idea um, of generally strict control within the experimental study now to connect this back to the previous lecture there was this idea of you know um hum the humanistic perspective versus the sort of logical positivist you know these are two different philosophies or epistemologies or ways of approaching research and you know the logical positivist is the one that says that things are best studied under strict control within the laboratory so experimental research stems out of that logical positivism school of scientific research so it is designed to allow for a lot of strict control of variables to sort of in some cases to um, identify compounds and control for them statistically or you know in your design and it relies on something we're going to we call statistical significance testing um, we're going to talk about this in a lot of details we go forward but the idea is that it's trying to give you a reasonable amount of faith in the fact that you've discovered a causal relationship between your independent and your dependent variable um, there's some examples from the book that I want to talk about that are, you know, little examples of an experimental design of each of, or sorry, non-experimental and experimental design. So let's start off with the non-experimental side to jump back for a moment. Um, Dunn and colleagues, again, this is going to be their research we focus on for this chapter as an example of these things, um, did a study in 2008 that was another happiness study. And what they really did was they simply submitted a survey to 632 randomly selected Americans, and it asked about their happiness, their charitable donations, and their annual income. So it was trying to get some handle on these variables they were interested in that underlie this theory they have. Remember, we talked a lot about going from th thus far, going from theory to testable hypothesis well they have what's this this theory they've developed is you know the the pro-social spending uh, theory of happiness well they need information about certain variables in order to begin to test that relationship and so in some of their research in 2008 they were doing non-experimental research they were just trying to get information on these three variables again that's happiness in a subjective way we'll talk about how they measure that a charitable note how much do you spend in charitable donations giving in reference to others of your of your financial security and then annual income but again this study was being used just to kind of look at the re the correlational relationship between these variables not saying one caused the other just how do they tend to vary based on one another are they related in any statistical way a related research that they did also in 2008 is much more uh is, is much better example of experimental research and this was the the pro-social spending hypothesis study that they conducted and this is where you had participants randomly assigned to one of four conditions based on two independent variables and again I don't want to get too in, in the weeds here but we're going to talk about what all these things mean in greater detail but essentially they were looking at two different variables of interest the first was um, assigning people to one condition of spending five dollars or spending twenty dollars so you have two levels of that independent variable that you're manipulating the persons uh, were randomly assigned to either be given five dollars to spend or be given twenty dollars to spend the second variable they were interested in was do you spend that money on yourself or on someone else and so essentially what you've got here then is this sort of cross that creates four conditions right you've got two independent variables they each have two levels so you randomly assign somebody to one of these four conditions um, sometimes this is referred to as a matrix right we have two variables crossing over like on an x and y axis a two 
two variable uh, study creates four conditions. Just to kind of flesh that out, not to belabor the point, that means that you could be assigned either $5 to spend on yourself, $5 to spend on someone else, $20 to spend on yourself, or $20 to spend on someone else. So you've got those four conditions it creates. This is called a two by two between subjects factorial design. And we will get into all those terms in detail as time goes on. We have a whole chapter coming up very soon on experimental research. So um, they're asked to spend this money by the end of the day. You're essentially given either five or $20 and you're said, we need you to spend this money by the end of the day. And then you were randomly assigned to either spend it on yourself or spend it on somebody else. And at the end of the day, the researchers then call the participants and ask them to rate their happiness. That's our dependent variable, right? Did the spending of the money on yourself or on others have a causal relationship later in the day, right? Temporal precedence, the cause precedes the effect to uh, your happiness, which in this case is our dependent variable. This is a classic example of an experimental design and it incorporates a lot of things we're gonna talk about in greater detail as we talk about all the um, aspects of experimental research design. Another division, another way we can sort of break up um, research into some important categories is based upon the primary goal or intent of the researcher. Like what are they trying to do essentially? And basic research is conducted in an attempt to understand, in psychology at least, in an attempt to understand the processes without regard for whether or not the knowledge is immediately applicable. It's just, this is, when they call it basic research, what it's really intended to do is just increase the body of understanding on a subject. Um, it doesn't really matter if you can then use that information for anything beyond simple knowledge, right? So basic research is sometimes thought about research for research's sake, for knowledge's sake alone. Applied research is where you are much more focused in on trying to find solutions for specific problems. Um, you're not just embracing general knowledge, but you want to be able to then take that information and do something with it. There's a subtype within applied research, which I was involved in when I was a grad student, um, which is called uh, evaluation research, which, which is where you're sort of looking at the efficacy of programs. And in our case, we were looking at how effective certain psychological therapies, cognitive behavioral therapies were uh, on, on different outcomes. You know, uh, the research that we did here at the Salem VA was based upon people's attendance of aftercare, like I mentioned before, and then how they per did in terms of abstaining from substances and, and other types of issues in their life related to substance abuse. Um, and then we also did some research collaboratively with the University of Washington School of Social Work out in Seattle, and that was related on um, treatment for people who were utilizing marijuana uh, and who were like sort of on the cusp of developing serious substance abuse problems, some interventions to try and decrease whether or not they would sort of turn that corner into substance abuse or continue to use moderately. And then also people that were seeking treatment, uh, how they did. This is all examples of evaluation research. And you're really just, you know, taking it out there into the world. With, often in the clinical field is where you'll see this type of applied research. Um, the lines are not always so clear between these types, uh, neither in terms of their intent or their content. You know, uh, no study is purely one or the other for the most part. I mean, if you go back, you could make an argument that in the early days of psychological research, some of these studies are clearly really basic research that don't have a direct application. Um, but ultimately, you know, there's a little bit from column A and a little from column B in, in each study, uh, but there's usually an emphasis in one direction or another. But you know, let me give an example of how these things can overlap. Um, let's say that you're conducting some basic research on neurological function, okay? You just wanna understand how the brain works in some form. If you then discover through that process that, oh, if I had a drug that could impact this process in the brain, um, so then you've now developed a, a new field of research or a new area of research uh, into drugs that can address that underlying neurological function that you were studying. And then that has implications for, uh, you know, how you develop medications to treat these conditions you might be looking at. Um, research on cognitive development has a lot of implications for how we design our educational systems, right? This basic research on how infants and children's brains develop can then inform and be applied to how should teachers teach in the classroom, you know, that kind of thing. Um, another example could be something like how motivational interviewing helps to, uh, to get people to, you know, quit smoking or quit drinking. Um, but that also then might lead you in the opposite direction, vice versa, to understand something about motivation as a construct. So there's, there's some research that's very um, important in the world of substance abuse 
regarding something called readiness to change, um, sort of trying to understand where people are in the process of deciding to change a behavior. And they have things like pre-contemplation, contemplation, action, preparation. These are all different places along the spectrum people might be in their readiness to change uh, behavior. And this research came out of very applied treatment out in um, New Mexico on substance abuse by Bill Miller and his colleagues. And that research then uh, led to a whole school of thought called motivational interviewing, motivational enhancement therapy. Uh, again, very applied, but out of all that applied research, all that clinical work, um, as they were be continuing to study how effective this treatment was in the real world in these sort of, you know, treatment and evaluation research studies, they began to understand some basic things about motivation as a construct, construct, excuse me. So the research like spun off from the applied angle and became uh, in some ways more about basic research of understanding motivation as a larger construct, just for the sake of understanding it to increase the body of knowledge. So um, there are some objectives that we have in, in when we conduct research, some very principal basic uh, objectives. One is to provide a scientific understanding of the topic we're investigating. So if you remember, we talked about the goals of science, right? In this case, we want to understand something more effectively. We want to describe the phenomenon. We want to explain the phenomenon. These are all different goals that we have. So first, when we're describing, what we're often doing is defining uh, our conceptual starting with a conceptual construct, you know, some hypothetical thing like memory or motivation that we're interested in and cr coming up with um, both conceptual and operational definitions of that. So our conceptual definition is the meaning of the abstract term. This is, you might think of this more as like a dictionary definition in some ways, but uh, let's look at the research of Dunn and colleagues that we're discussing in this chapter. They're essentially asking the question, what is happiness? Right. This is a this is a big philosophical question. This is a very conceptual, in some sense, a very basic research related question. Right. We're trying to understand uh, a really huge aspect of human psychology and they need to define that in some way when they're gonna, if they're going to do this research that says does money buy happiness, you know, and get more into into the depth about pro social spending, they have to define it somehow. And what they essentially define uh, happiness as in their study is what they call subjective well-being. And it's really um, a definition of happiness as does the person perceive themselves as doing well? Do they feel positively about themselves? Like that's how they're, they're defining happiness in terms of conception, right? In terms of construct. Um, their pro-social spending is, you know, they're saying simply uh, the amount, spending money on others, they're defining as pro-social spending. These are conceptual definitions. They're not being specific or even more general than money, right? Uh, giving of oneself for the, the benefit of others in a, in, a, in a practical way, in a concrete way. You then have to come up with an operational definition from that conceptual one, right? So the operational definition flows from the conceptual definition and indicates how the concept is coded, measured or quantified. Right? We're taking something that is abstract, something that we can't put our finger on in the real world. We can't point to it and say, that's happiness, that's motivation. We have to find a way to translate it into the real world, into a way that can be quantified, that can be measured, that can actually be studied. I wanna stop for a moment and really emphasize how important this concept is in research. We are making a leap, right? We are going from something hypothetical, cerebral in our minds that we think about as a, as a construct, as a concept, you, it does not exist in the real world. And we are making a choice about how to then bring it into the real world and clarify it in some way that we can visualize, we can observe, we can measure in some way, right? And there's a whole variety of ways in which we can measure those things, but we have to be able to pull it into the real world somehow. And as you can probably glean from this discussion, this is a place where the first mistakes can happen. This is ultimately uh, a very early step where your own personal biases can be a serious problem in your research. They can introduce a lot of error, so to speak. They can make the research less valid because essentially as a researcher, you have to make choices um, at that point. Going from a construct to a operational definition requires you to, um, to make choices. Um, let me give you another example for, you know, so let's say that I'm interested in the concept or the construct of, and I'm going to use concept and construct interchangeably, the construct of ag aggression in children. Okay. 
Um, I'm a developmental researcher, for example, and I want to understand why children can be aggressive and how that's related to the development of their brains, maybe is a good example of a type of research you might see. Um, what do I mean when I say aggression? Right? How do I define that? I know what I mean. I might even have a really good conceptual definition utilizing other terms, um, but how do I then take that into the real world? I could decide that it's, you know, counting the number of times children physically strike or push one another on the playground. I might look for, I might code body language in some way that I can turn it into a number. I have observers watch children in the classroom and, or have teachers after the fact write down, you know, a tally of the number of incidents of aggression. But all of those decisions um, of how I'm going to measure it are choices that I'm making as a researcher. And I have biases that are going to influence which choices I make. One way to try and control for this, of course, is to be a good student of the of the existing literature, right? To go into existing studies and journal articles and, and books on this subject and look at what other researchers have done. You may not agree with them 100% and take their definition whole cloth, but you're certainly going to be informed by the people that have gone before you in the research process. So I've, I've thrown a lot of dichotomies at you so far in, in this chapter, right? We've, we've talked about some important distinctions um, in research itself. So we've got non-experimental versus experimental research. We have basic versus applied research. We have this concept of conceptual and operational definitions. There's a lot of dichotomies going on right now. And there's one more uh, that I want to discuss, and that's our strategy. And this is going to be tied in the end to the type of research you're conducting, which we'll discuss in a moment. But there is a distinction that can be made, and it's really a, a distinction of direction, how we're connecting these worlds of theory and operational definition or hypotheses, right? How are we going from the real world to the more abstract, hypothetical world of concepts that we're discussing? So deductive research is the one that is most often used in, ex in experimental designs, right? And this is where you go from from theory to hypothesis, right? You uh, derive hypotheses from a theory to, the, to test that theory. So the scientific method in this case is using deduction to test hypotheses and theories. So inductive, in what they call deductive inference, we hold a theory and based on it, we make a prediction of its consequences. That is, we predict what the observation should be if the theory is correct. So in that sense, we are going from the general, the theory, to the specific, the observation. That's, that's the flow of information direction there. So let me reiterate that one more time. In deduction, we're testing hypotheses, right? So we hold a theory. We start off with a theory, uh, um, a theory about motivation, a theory about development, a theory about whatever in psychology. And based on it, we make a prediction about consequences. We predict the observations that we should find if our theory is correct. We're going again from the general, the theory, to the specific, the observations. Vice versa, the opposite of that is inductive research. And this is more typically used in non-experimental designs. And we're going to talk about different types of experimental and non-experimental designs in a moment. The inductive reasoning process uses the results from the tests of a theory and from other research to verify the propositions of a theory and modify it as necessary. So it's going the opposite direction. In inductive inference, we're going from the specific to the general. We make many observations, we look at all the studies that have been done, and we discern a pattern to make a generalization and infer a theory, all right, to inform a theory. Regardless of which direction we're going in this process, there's two really important elements that are uh, in, involved in all scientific research strategies, and they are essentially data and theory, as we're talking about. So data, as I said earlier in, I think, a previous lecture, is the empirical observations that allow the researcher to evaluate the theory, right? So in deductive research, when we're trying to test the theory, when we go in and then conduct our study, that produces data, which we're then going to go back and see if our predictions were accurate, those predictions that we derived from a theory. So again, from theory to observation. Um, the theory, as we mentioned in previous lectures, is the set of propositions that explain the occurrences, that explain the inconsistency. So the theory is really providing some major functions. What it's doing is it's organizing and explaining and predicting. Um, the data is the test of those predictions.
so in reality, the pro when, we're, when we're actually conducting research designed to sort of test our explanations for psychological phenomena, there's a dynamic interplay between these two things, deductive and inductive. It's actually something in which you're going back and forth and back and forth. And we're going to look at a, a, a diagram in a moment to help explain this. But it's sometimes referred to as the research circle. So let's talk about that for a moment. So this is from your book. This is the research circle. And this shows, if you look at the inner circle here, you see that deductive research flows naturally into more inductive research. So it's not like researchers in the, in the world go out and conduct one type versus another. It's something that we're doing. It's part of the process of furthering science, of going from one to the other. So at the top of this diagram, we have, um, you know, we see theory here. And we then will, from that theory, derive a hypothesis and test it. Okay, that produces data. That data informs what's going on and it starts to enter into an inductive process where we're now in, you know, getting descriptions and information about the theory itself. That leads to empirical generalizations and informs the theory further and the circle continues. So the theory gets modified and refined and adjusted based upon the new research and we start the process over again. I want to talk now about a way that your book um, sort of delineates these distinctions in different types of research. And I really like this, this heuristic, right? This mental shortcut, if you remember the term heuristic, um, this mental shortcut they use is called the research toolbox. And what they're essentially saying is that in research, we have a variety of tools available to us to investigate scientific questions. And they break this down into six different areas. Um, true experiments, quasi-experiments, correlational research, sampling and survey design, performance-based measures, literature review, and qualitative research. Um, these are just different tools that you have available to you uh, to help you investigate things that you're interested in. So, for example, let's say that you are interested in people's motivation. Um, I'm sorry, let's, let's, let's use the example from the book, right? Let's talk about Dunn's research. If you are interested in people's degree of happiness and how that's related to wealth or in their case if that's more related to how you spend that money on others right that's a hypothetical construct conceptual uh, theory right but I want to test that theory and I want to flesh that theory out and I want to understand it and I want to obtain data that I can then bring back in an inductive process and refine the theory. And maybe at the end of the day, what happens is I say, I don't think the theory is correct. And maybe the theory is entirely wrong and we, we throw it out altogether. But in most situations, what happens is we modify the theory, we adjust the theory and we make some changes so that it, we think it more accurately reflects what we're seeing in the real world. And in doing so, in that process of, you know, developing a whole program of research of multiple studies over years, you have all these tools available in your toolkit. These are all things you can reach for in order to uh, look at those, those constructs. These are all different approaches. So let's talk about each of them in a, a very brief detail. Um, and what you'll quickly realize as we go through this is that there is a chapter within the book on every single one of these. So we're, we are going to go into great detail investigating all of these, um, these different tools that are in your toolkit. I'd like to talk now about the first in the many tools in your research toolbox, and that is the randomized or true experiment. Um, in a randomized experiment, one or more independent variables are deliberately manipulated by the researcher to assess their impact, their effect on an outcome, and that outcome we refer to as the dependent variable. In a true experiment, researchers have the greatest amount of control over who, what, and how the study is conducted. So it does involve a lot of rigorous control over the environment and, and how the person experiences the study compared to some of the other tools um, that are more naturalistic in how they observe things. But as mentioned above, you know, it really is about manipulating an independent variable. This is the element of the study that you systematically change, select, uh, alter in some way for your participants and then measuring how that observed effect uh, outcome result changes in a systematic way. Um, what you're looking for essentially is that you want to see a systematic change between the manipulation and then the outcome in the dependent variable measurement. So let me give you a, a quick example, just hypothetically. Um, in the clinical world, let's say that I've developed a new type of psychotherapy approach that I want to test out, right? I have this new approach for depression, for example. 
and I would have to bring participants into a study if I was doing a true experiment and I would have to assign them to one of these levels of my independent variable like what treatment are they going to get so in one case in one level I would have my new approach I would then compare it to another level of the independent variable something like whatever the industry standard is right now or in some cases no treatment right we sometimes refer to that as a control condition I want to see what happens with people where I don't introduce anything and then you know you might compare them to things like medications in the world of depression but these are going to be different levels of your independent variable and as the researcher um, I'm controlling and we'll, we'll talk about how you're controlling that which level or which treatment in this case the person receives and then I would measure some outcome in this case probably their depression you know at a certain time down the road I might look at immediately after treatment I might look a month later six months whatever it is but ultimately I would want to see that people who did my uh, my therapy I'm hoping I would see people who underwent my new therapy would have lower levels of depression for example what I'm trying to establish is that there's a causal relationship between which level of the independent variable the person received and then the outcome that I'm looking at so causality is the name of the game when it comes to uh, true experiments and they have what are called high internal validity now we've talked a little bit about validity and reliability we're going to talk a little more about it in this lecture towards the end and we're also going to come back to it over and over so this is a, a subject that you're going to have hopefully plenty of opportunities to get a handle on but one type of validity Okay. And remember that validity means essentially how accurate is the study. Internal validity is essentially saying uh, to what degree of accuracy can the study say that there is a causal relationship between that independent variable and that dependent variable, between how I manipulated the independent variable and the outcome. Another really core and important aspect of what defines a true experiment is what's called random assignment of participants. This is a critical feature of experimental design what it ensures is that each individual each participant in the study has the exact same random chance of being in any level of the independent variable I am not selecting in when you know, myself who goes where who gets my treatment and who gets nothing or who gets the industry standard it is being randomly assigned and it is the best method for controlling bias and confounding variables uh, and we'll talk in great detail about what I mean by that but essentially by randomly assigning people to the various levels of the independent variable I'm trying to control for bias um, confounding variables let's say there's something about individuals that I think is gonna influence whether or not their depression gets better well those individuals will randomly hopefully be an equal number if I just use random assignment I'll end up with equal numbers of people with that characteristic or without it in each group so it's really an attempt to try and eliminate noise eliminate confounds and uh, bias from the study so going back to the example from Dunn and colleagues uh, this was that pro-social spending theory where you were randomly assigned to receive five dollars or twenty dollars that was one independent variable there were two levels right and then you were randomly assigned to either spend the money on yourself or spend the money on someone else right so what you've got then is four conditions there's a high and low of each or not high and low I shouldn't say there's a high and low of the money and there's a pro-social versus self-spending and the other um, you're given this money it's called it's a windfall right so the idea is that it creates four conditions by crossing over those two variables you get four possible combinations you could have the five dollar windfall spend it on yourself the five dollar windfall spend it on others the pro social spending twenty dollar windfall spend it on yourself or twenty dollar windfall spend it on others every participant who walked in that study who was enrolled in the study had an equal chance randomly assigned to one of those conditions so that is a critical feature of an experimental design and I just want to be clear we're going to utilize the term true experiment and randomized experiment pretty much interchangeably your book does the same so please don't be confused by that I want you to think of those two things as synonymous so to continue talking a little bit about randomized or true experiments um, the reason again another aspect of this being the, the gold standard in, in research design is that it is one that has the strongest test of a research hypothesis that can then propose that cause and effect relationship between the independent and the dependent variable in some cases what you'll see is that you're comparing groups and a, a very typical example of a randomized or true experiment is um, is one that's listed here where there's basically three conditions right 
There is the treatment group condition. This is sometimes referred to as the experimental group condition. This is the group that receives the treatment or the intervention that we're really interested in. So in my example of a, a new treatment for depression, this would be the people that receive that new treatment, right? They get the experimental condition. I then might also have a control condition. Um, that person would receive nothing. I would measure their depression on day one. And then after uh, I had given the treatment to the other groups, I would then just measure their depression again. They would never receive any kind of intervention. So in that case, what we're really testing is how does my treatment compare to doing nothing, right? Um, we might also include what's called a placebo group. And this is where the person gets what's called an, an inert substance sham procedure. So like in a drug trial, for example, the placebo group is often you know, the person's receiving a benign substance like water, um, you know, glucose, something that's not going to have any real impact on your body in any way. Um, but the idea is that you still have the experience of going in and getting an injection or an infusion or taking a pill or whatever it is. Um, in case that's going to have some impact, which we know that placebo effect does work, we want to make sure that we know what's causing it. So um, in treatment studies in clinical psychology, a placebo group might be okay. Uh, when I do my new treatment, that means that I'm going to meet with my subjects for uh, 30 minutes, five times over the next month. Um, that's going to be like what I think is the appropriate dose of my new treatment for depression. Well, maybe there's something to be said for just meeting with someone and that that has an impact. And so in a placebo group, what I might do is have that group meet with a therapist, but not really do any therapy. Or I might have them spend the exact same amount of time in a similar setting receiving information about something unrelated. Um, so the idea is that you're trying to uh, see if there's any impact for just participating in the intervention, even if it's not the, the actual thing that you're studying that's causing the change. This is best exemplified. Uh, you see this a lot in the um, treatment outcome, the efficacy research these days, and that's what's called a randomized clinical trial. This is, um, again, kind of the gold standard of the gold standard. It's often referred to as a double blind procedure as well. This is where both the researcher and the participants are blind to who's receiving the real treatment, drug, intervention, or whatever. So let me explain why this might be important, and, and hopefully you can follow me on this for like how it might work in a drug trial, right? We know that giving people a pill and telling them that it's supposed to do something can have an impact. That's, that's the placebo effect. So let's say that, you know, so it makes sense that it's really important that the person receiving the medication does not know which level they're in, right? If I really want to test the placebo effect, then everyone is told you may or may not be receiving the experimental drug. You may be in the placebo group, may you may not, but they don't know. That way you're controlling for that influence. In a double blind procedure, the person administering the drug, the researcher, the, and this might be the person who's, you know, the head of it yourself, who's like the professor who's doing the research. It might be your assistants. It might be graduate students that are helping. You might be, you know, people you've employed to do whatever it is. They don't know either. And the reason is because they may unintentionally influence the outcome. If I am uh, giving someone a drug for uh, you know a, a serious issue, right? let's say that we're testing a new uh, cancer treatment, for example, and I'm the researcher, and I know that some of the you know some people, half the people perhaps that are in this study are getting a benign substance that is not going to treat their cancer, right? But they're being told you might be getting the treatment, you might not, you might be getting the placebo. If I know that, I might unintentionally even in subtle ways give that away somehow or otherwise influence the study. Um, it could be as simple as the look on my face. The, uh, it could be the way that I talk to them, the way that I treat them. It might be completely without my knowledge that I'm doing it. It might be very subtle and implicit in certain ways. So in a double blind procedure, in a randomized clinical trial, uh, not even the person administering the medications or the drug or whatever it is that's being tested knows who's getting what and who's getting the placebo. All right, well, this ends part one of two on this uh, lecture covering chapter two of your textbook. I will see you for part two.